Hi, I'm Jack Mather. Uh, lived here for a long time, moved away for a long time, now I'm back. <clears throat> I'll start this presentation in Pilkington in the county of Lancaster, England in the year 1795. Don't worry, this will progress fairly quickly. <laughs> it was in Pilkington that my great-great-grandfather James Mather was born. When James was 17 years old, he enlisted in the army as a private in the King's Dragoon Guards. He served in the army for almost 26 years and was discharged as a sergeant in consequence of chronic affection of the liver and stomach. History tells us that the King's Dragoon Guards fought with Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. It was here that Emperor Napoleon of France was defeated for once and for all and sent to his exile in St. Helena. I would like to tell you that James fought heroically and personally saved Wellington's ass, but I cannot. I'm a, in fact, I'm not even sure he was there, although family legend has it that he was. At 20 years old and holding the rank of private, he surely would have been a prime candidate for cannon fodder. In any case, he survived, and therefore, I'm here to tell you all this. The reason I have this information on James is that I have had passed down to me his account book, that's his enlistment papers, his discharge from the Army, and his marriage certificate. Here's a quick summary of the Mather genealogy from James Forward. James begat Abraham. Abraham begat George. George begat Alfred. And Alfred begat Jack. I intend to break the rest of this tome into two chapters. The first chapter will cover those of my ancestors who came to Canada, and the second will be a brief account of my own follies over the last 73 years. The first of our family to arrive in Canada was my grandfather, Joe Taylor, who came to Penhold in the Northwest Territories, now Alberta, in June 1894, when he was 17 years old. He came on his own to visit relatives who were farming in the district and who, through some sort of communication mix-up, had not received any notice of his pending arrival. His letters home to his family in England give a good insight into farm life on the prairies, and he recounts his day-to-day -day experiences. He seems to have stayed on the farm through most of the winter of 94-95 before he returned to England. In 1910, the emigration of my family from England to Canada began in earnest. George Mather had married Ethel Killing back in 1901, and they had three children, my Aunt Betty, my father Alfred, and my Uncle Jack. The family of five arrived in Halifax in December of 1910 and came on to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, where they settled. In 1913, he filed on a homestead of 160 acres <clears throat> near the town of Dunkirk, Saskatchewan, which was about 40 miles south of Moose Jaw. He was not deterred by the fact that his chosen quarter section of land had been twice abandoned by previous settlers as unsuitable for farming, and by 1919, he and the family had completed improvements required by the Homestead Act, including a 10 by 16 foot house, and so they took title to the land. While the family lived on the farm, George was hired by other settlers in the region to teach at a one-room school that had been built at Dunkirk. From the homestead documents I have, it seems that George farmed and taught school in the summers and returned to Moose Jaw and sold insurance in the winters. I remember him telling me that my grandmother, Ethel, also a teacher, taught some home economics for a time in a school in North Dakota while they were living on the homestead. In 1920, the family moved back to Moose Jaw full-time, and George was hired as the principal of King Edward's school, where he served until 1927. Back to Joe Taylor. In 1907, Joe had married Ellen Ellis, and they had a daughter in 1910 named Kathleen, who, as many of you know, is Fred Green's mother. My knowledge of the Taylor history is a little scant, and I trust that Fred will be able to fill in some of the blanks when he speaks here. I should mention that Joe Taylor and George Mather have become friends in England, so when the Taylor family of three emigrated to Canada in 1912, they came to Moose Jaw, where the two families reconnected. Soon after the Taylors arrived in Moose Jaw, another daughter, Winifred, was born to them. If you didn't already know or haven't guessed, Winifred was to become my mother. Joe Taylor also entered the insurance business of Moose Jaw. In fact, the Moose Jaw City Directory for 1912 lists George Mather as a sales manager for Henry Y. Smith & Company and Joe Taylor as a salesman for the same firm. It seems that the Taylors did not regard Moose Jaw as an ideal location to build their future in Canada. In the spring of 1913, Joe set out for the West Coast, leaving his small family in Moose Jaw to await word from him 
that he had found a more suitable situation. Now the scene of the action shifts to Vancouver Island. Joe came to Victoria where he had contacts from the old country. Although office work was scarce in Victoria, he was able to secure a position with Canadian Puget Sound Company at their logging camp in Jordan River. He was able to get a company house to rent and soon Ellen and the children joined him there. Of course, there was no road to Jordan River in 1913, so all passengers and freight were transported by water from Victoria and taken ashore by whatever means deemed appropriate given the current state of tide and weather. The personal chattels of the Taylor family, which I am told included a piano, were transported in and out by this method. The Jordan River job was just the first of many in the forest industry for Joe Taylor. Over the ensuing 30 plus years, he worked at camps and mills all around southern Vancouver Island. Locations included Cowichan Lake, Genoa Bay, Sydney, and Victoria. When my mother was in her early teens, this would be the mid-1920s, the family lived in Sydney at the south end of 2nd Street, across from the present day location of the Anacortes Ferry Wharf. By the late 1920s, the family had moved to Victoria and finally settled in a handsome house at 232 St. Andrews Street one block east of Government Street between Emily Carr House and the Parliament Buildings. Also in the 1920s, my great-grandparents and my great-aunt came from Vancouver Island. Richard and Harriet Ellis were Ellen Taylor's parents, and Winifred Peg Ellis was Ellen's sister. They lived for a time in Sydney, and eventually, after Richard's passing, Harriet and Aunt Peg lived in a house also on St. Andrew Street, built by Ivan Green. Meanwhile, back in Moose Jaw, the Mathers to continued to tough it out the prairie winters and summer heat while George taught school. Alfred, Betty, and Jack matured into adulthood and started careers. During their teen years, Alfred and Jack took a keen interest in amateur ham radio. My father's certificate of proficiency in radio te telegraphy was issued to him when he was 19 and is numbered number 230 in Canada. The boys also had an early day hot rod. It was a fenderless Model T, which they referred to as a bug. Betty was athletic and played basketball on the women's rep team representing Moose Jaw. My father was musically talented and played violin in a symphony orchestra that performed on the radio. Finally, in 1927, George retired from teaching and made plans to move to Vancouver Island. By this time, Betty was working for the CPR and was enamored with a railroader by the name Albert Ward. Jack had decamped for Peterborough, Ontario, to pursue a career in electronics, and Alfred worked for an import-export firm in Moose Jaw. My grandparents came to Saanich and bought a five-acre chicken farm on Brookley Road, just a few hundred yards and around the corner from Cunningham's gas station. And they, along with my father, took up residence in late 1927. Over the next dozen years, some pretty much routine stuff took place. Back in Moose Jaw, Betty married Albert, my cousin Joan was born. Jack married Lillian in Peterborough, and they moved to Halifax. Over on the Taylor side, Kathleen had married Ivan Green, and cousins Fred and John arrived. Also, the Taylors and the Mathers had reconnected, and evidently, Alfred Mather and Winifred Taylor realized that eight years difference in age didn't seem a lot at ages 31 and 23. They were married and took up residence in a rented house on East Saanich Road at Elk Lake in 1935. My father worked in a couple of different financial firms in Victoria and spent most of his career as an investment advisor at Hager Investments. Chapter 2. This chapter will cover my lifespan to date. It started here on the peninsula and this is where I expect it will end. I was born on the 22nd of May 1939 which happened to coincide with a visit to Victoria by King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. This meant that while the rest of the family could go and see the royal procession, my mother was stuck in the Jubilee Hospital attending to my arrival. The first, but not the only time, I was near to my mother. Ten days later, our neighbor Gladys Cunningham was in the same bed, and her firstborn, Gary, arrived into the world. Also in 1939, Canada declared war on Germany. The War Years. There's a picture in our family album of my second birthday gathering, evidently hosted by my mother as some sort of social event for the ladies of the district. Seated around the table in our garden are Nori Spencer, Fred Green, John Green, Noni Pearson, me, Sylvia Pearson, Brenda Tucky, Peter Goddard, and Judy Goddard. A note on the back states that Gary Cunningham was sick and he couldn't come. 
Although I have no recollection of this event, I do have some memories from that time. We lived very close to the East Saanich Road, and it was common during the war years for the military to move equipment from Gordon Head, or Squimalt, to Pat Bay. This was done in convoy, so to my eyes we were attending a parade. It was in the early 40s that I showed my first interest in cars. Every Saturday morning my father would go to my grandparents' home on Brookley Road and chop a week's worth of firewood for them. I usually attended to visit my grandparents. On one of these visits, my father found it necessary to make some adjustments under the hood of our family car, a small English vehicle called a Singer. I observed that when he pulled on a small cable that ran from the firewall to somewhere further forward in the vehicle, the engine would spring to life. I filed this knowledge away for future reference. Soon enough, the car stood in the driveway unattended, but with the hood still up. I, of course, climbed onto the running board, up the fender, and gave the subject cable a tug of my own. Fortunately, by this time, the ignition had been turned off. However, the transmission had also been put into gear. So when I tugged, the starter engaged, the vehicle lurched ahead, and I was deposited on my backside in the driveway. This series of events caught my father's immediate attention, and my backside received a further assault. In 1944, my sister Anne was born. That same year, my grandmother, Ethel Mather, died suddenly of a heart attack, and our granddad, who became who had become pretty much infirm by then, came to live with us. Now the school years. I started my education in this building, referred to as the little school. The two-room building across the schoolyard was known as the big school. The only washrooms on the property were in the basement of the big school. That building also contained the office of our dreaded principal, Mrs. Welsh. Our teacher was Miss Oldaver, who when she was out of earshot, the boys referred to as Old Lady Old Haver. In hindsight, I suppose she was in her early 20s at the time. Miss Old Haver was the first of my teachers to realize that little Jackie Mather had a remarkably short attention span. And after his mind had wandered a little, he was liable to do or say things that were entirely inappropriate. This failing on my part earned me on two occasions in the first grade, a long trip across the schoolyard to be interviewed by Mrs. Welsh would first deliver a lecture and then a strapping. I'm sure the strap was not laid on as severely as it seemed at the time, however it was always deemed worth avoiding. The rest of my public school records remain remarkably unblemished by any notes of superior scholastic achievement, athletic awards, or deeds of good citizenship. In 1952, I entered grade nine at the brand new Royal Oak High School, where I finished my schooling and was a member of a the 24 student graduating class in 1956. I can say that I never had a favorite teacher, but on the other hand, I doubt that any of my teachers ever considered me their favorite student. <laughs> Time out of school was an entirely different matter. Growing up at Elk Lake meant that once a child had gained the ability to swim fairly well, the whole lake and its shoreline became a great playground. In our younger years, activities were pretty much confined to the summers, and swimming was supervised by our parents, or at least a neighbor teenager. However, as we matured, lake-related activities became pretty much a year-round affair. In a couple of particularly cold wi winters, we even got enough ice to try skating. Sometime during my early youth, one of the utility companies deposited some used poles by the lakeshore. These were the perfect foundation for the construction of rafts, and several, several were built over the course of a few years. I remember one that had a large table mounted amidships. The sides of the table were boarded in from the deck to the tabletop, and this served as a cabin. <clears throat> a diving board was mounted at one end, and the whole apparatus provided endless amusement. The raft was usually propelled by long poles, so we didn't often venture too far from shore. However, if we improvised paddles and used boards, the thing could be paddled into the middle of the lake on a summer day. We had only then to go into the cabin, strip off our clothes, and make a running leap off the diving board for an unhampered skinny dip. <laughs> a favorite activity in the spring was spearing catfish. There were lots of catfish in Elk Lake, and they hung out in a large expanse of yellow flowered water lilies at the, end of, at the south end of the lake about where the rowing club is situated today. A spear was fashioned from a piece of small diameter steel rod, and that was ground to a point. 
A barb was hacksawed into the side of the rod about an inch from the point, and this weapon was attached to the end of a long wooden pole. Spearing catfish required two participants, one hunter and one pole man. On a bright, calm day, the catfish could be spotted in the roots of the lily pads from the front of the boat, being slowly pulled through the leaves. An accurate thrust of the spear aimed at the catfish's head would occasionally yield the quarry, who was to become the main course of lunch cooked on an open fire on the beach. Actually, catfish properly filleted and fully cooked is quite tasty. Another must-do in the spring for us kids was a hike up Bear Mountain, where the fawn lilies, we call them Easter lilies, grew in profusion. We would pick armloads of them and bring them home for our mothers. They're illegal to pick these days. These expeditions were usually led by the Cunningham boys as they knew the way through the Arrow Estate. If all else failed and we had energy that needed spending, we would take a walk around Beaver and Elk Lakes. I suppose we're the pioneers of a formal walking trail over this route that exists today. For a time before starting high school, I had a daily colonist paper route that took me from Cunningham's store through the Keating Valley to Martindale Road, returning to Elk Lake via the East Saanich Road. This was a fairly long ride to be accomplished before school. So after a few months, with the, colon the colonist was persuaded to drop the valley portion of the route and the job became more manageable. It was from the proceeds of this route that I started buying hot rod magazines at Cunningham's store. Working years. During the summers following grade 11 and 12, I found summer employment with the BC Forest Service, working in a youth crew that built campsites for the traveling public. My first summer was near Terrace, and the second year was in the Bella Coola Valley. We lived in tents and were paid $3 a day with all meals provided. After grade 12, and with no other prospects in view, I applied for full-time work with the Forest Service, and when the summer job was over, I was assigned to work as a compassman for a timber cruising party in the Prince Rupert Forest District. This district covered the whole northwest corner of the province, but most of our work was along Highway 16 between Rupert and Burns Lake. We did have one assignment that left a lasting memory with me. We had been sent to Rivers Inlet in October 1957 to cruise a huge patch of timber in the Kildella River Valley. Actually, the job proved to be undoable for our small crew, but we did make an attempt lasting about a week. Two of us were working alone in the valley where the river was full of spawning salmon. As we came right alongside the river, we could see ahead on our side of the river two grizzly bears, a sow and a year old cub, scooping fish out of the water. We were several miles from where we had left the boat and we were completely unarmed. As we watched the fishing party and tried not to contemplate our immediate future, we decided the best thing to do was stay put and see what the bears intended to do. Eventually, they swam across the river to a gravel bar there, and after scooping a couple more salmon, the mother bear stood up on her hind legs, sniffed the air, and then both of them galloped off into the woods, away from where we were standing. Evidently, she had caught our scent and decided that they might be in danger. After a summer of fending off mosquitoes sandwiched between two winters on snowshoes, I decided that maybe I should return home to Elk Lake and start over. This was the spring of 1958, and I was 18 years old. After a couple of months of job hunting, I was able to get a job as a junior clerk in the Toronto Dominion Bank. The starting wage was the princely sum of $150 a month. Nevertheless, things were starting to look up for me. I wasn't bad at fundamental arithmetic and soon found myself in the position of teller. Also, I had joined the Victoria Quartermaster's Club Hot Rod Club. The club had been formed with the stated aim of obtaining a quarter mile drag strip to give enthusiasts a safe place to test their modified cars. The founding members were Darrell Foster, Bob Clark, Gary Dickinson, and Harvey Stratford. These four and the other members, including my friend Gary Cunningham, who had joined before I did, seemed to be destined for success, and it did my self-esteem some good to be part of this organization. Actually, the Quarter Miners was as much a young man's service club as it was a car club. We participated in Christmas toy runs, blood drives, club car safety inspections, etc., and generally tried to improve the public's view of the hot rod community. The club put on annual car shows in the Victoria Curling Rink starting in 1958, and these required considerable organizational skills. Darrell was a key player in these events, both as an organizer and an exhibitor. 
After just over a year working in the bank's Victoria branch, I was transferred to the Lake Cowichan branch. The bank had no way of knowing what a huge favor they had given me. About two weeks after I started there, two recent high school graduates came to work in our branch. One of these was a girl named Margaret Major. I was, as they say, smitten. My quest for a date with this girl was not without its obstacles. For one thing, she had a boyfriend. I was beginning to learn that a goal worth achieving required patience and tenacious pursuit. After about 10 months of carrying on the pursuit, the patience was rewarded. Margaret agreed to accompany me to Victoria one spring evening in 1960. Long story short, we were married in June of 61 and have remained so for almost 52 years. Our first home was in Prince George, where the bank had sent me to a position of assistant accountant. Not a bad title, but still pretty paltry money. I'm afraid that Margaret had visions of grander accommodations than the poorly heated basement suite that I had chosen for us. We lived there for the first week or so without furniture or any of our household items. We were waiting for the PGE Railway to take their sweet time bringing our goods from the coast. We now knew why the locals asserted that PGE stood for Prince George eventually. <laughs> After two years in Prince George, the bank rewarded me with a position as accountant in one of its East Vancouver branches. As before, not a bad title, but still pretty paltry money. After six years in the bank and still receiving a wage that, which flirted with the national poverty level, we decided that a career change was in order for me. By this time, we were a family of four with six and 20-month-old daughters, and there was no more stretch in the family finances. At the urging of my father-in-law, I applied for a job with BC Forest Products in the Kaikus logging office. Kaikus is where Margaret had spent her preschool, high school, growing up years and where her father was still employed. Based more so on the major family good reputation than on my own credentials, I was hired as the assistant camp accountant in December 1964. We packed up our scant belongings into a bar borrowed pickup truck and a U-Haul trailer and moved into a company house in camp. With a raise in income and company subsidized housing, things were again looking up. This was a be the beginning of a 28-year stint with BCFP and its successor company, Fletcher Challenge Canada Limited. Life was never dull with BCFP as we moved from one logging camp to another, then as an itinerant accountant based in Vancouver for a while, then on to fledgling Mackenzie, BC for four years, then to Maple Ridge for positions in both sawmill and logging offices, and finally into the head office in downtown Vancouver. In our early days at Kaikus, we realized that the key to any real financial success as a company employee was further education for me. To this end, I enrolled in a course of studies towards the professional accounting designation of Registered Industrial Accountant, RIA, now called a CMA. The course was offered by distance learning and assignments were submitted to McMaster University in Cam Hamilton, Ontario. After eight years of study at what was designed as a five-year program, I did receive my degree in 1974. I was never a good student, and this achievement was only made possible by the unfailing support and sacrifices of my family. BCFP was an excellent company to work for, but alas, it seems true that all good things must sooner or later come to an end. In the late 1980s, the company was taken over by New Zealand-based multinational Fletcher Challenge and merged with Crown Forest Industries, which they already owned. By late 1991, the merged company was much reduced in size, as Fletcher sold off its assets and reduced the size of its management staff. Corporate politics was rife, and the place was not a pleasant place to be. I was offered the choice of a job equal to the one I was in, at an office to be established in Crofton, or a generous retirement package. Spurred on by spending Christmas week 1991 in Lionsgate Hospital with what the doctor termed a stress-related bleeding ulcer, and in cons consultation with my family, I took the package. Now for a complete change of pace. It had been a long-held ambition of mine to become a farmer. This was probably fostered by my grandfather's fond memories of the Saskatchewan homestead 
by hanging around my cousin Fred's Uncle Harold's farm at Elk Lake, and by taking family holidays at Mark Margaret's uncle's farm in Alberta. In early 1992, we sold the house we had built seven years earlier in West Vancouver and bought a small farm in Armstrong, BC. Margaret and our daughters were in full support. Many others thought we had taken leave of our senses. Margaret's parents were apprehensive, having spent the dirty 30s depression on struggling farms in Alberta. I'm sure the West Vancouver neighbors wondered what the hell we were doing, but they did give us a nice going away party. Even the driver of the moving van who took our household goods to Armstrong questioned our sanity. For my part, the 14 years on the farm was the best time of my working life. Perhaps not so much so for Margaret, who was suddenly thrust into the role of tractor driver, hay tester, and general gopher. Believe me, the whole venture would have been a far different experience without Margaret's support and understanding. We started by purchasing a tractor and a suite of haying equipment with the proceeds from a sailboat, the sale of a sailboat, which we had been part of the West Vancouver lifestyle. We made hay only on our own land that first year and sold it to two neighboring dairy farmers. There was little sell selling effort on our part. The neighbors and the people of Armstrong Town were welcoming to us and we almost instantly felt at home there. That first year, Friends from BCFP days who shared my interest in farming came to visit and see what we were up to. They liked what they saw and bought eight acres of nearby hayland of their own. They then commissioned us to farm it for them. More machinery was required and the venture was growing. Over the years on the farm, rented land came and went and at one time we were making hay on nearly 300 acres. More machinery was purchased. Actually, that was a recurring theme. As time passed and markets fluctuated, we started doing custom work for other farmers and small landowners. From time to time, when we had an abundance of unsold hay in our sheds, we kept some beef cattle. For a couple of years, we had a small bunch of beef cows which produced calves in the spring. These were weaned in the fall and sent to the local cattle auction. One spring morning in 2006, over coffee, Margaret and I started musing about life after farming. After all, I was approaching 67 years old and she 65. <clears throat> In what amounted to a few minutes, we had decided that now was the time to realize our retirement dream of moving back to Vancouver Island. In the recent past, our next door neighbor, a dairy farmer and customer of ours over the years, mentioned that if we should ever want to sell, he would be interested in buying our place. We shared almost a half a mile of fence, so the expansion of his farm onto ours was easily accomplished. After coffee, I walked across the field to his place and announced that the place was for sale. In a few days, a deal was consummated and he paid the full asking price, but did require that we include one of our tractors in the deal. We proceeded to dispose of the rest of the farming equipment locally and at a farm sale to sell shop equipment and supplies. We then started looking for a place to live on the Sandwich Peninsula. As most of you know, we are now settled in Brentwood Bay. During the last few years in, on the farm, my interest in hot rods was re rekindled. We got back into the hobby with a 1955 Ford pickup, which we purchased in Washington State. Soon I was wishing to recreate the ride I had when I was in the Quartermaster's Club, circa 1958 to 1960. To this end, the remnants of a 1944 Tudor were acquired in Sycamus, BC, and construction of our present hot rod began. The main body of work was assigned to ex quartermiler Al Clark, and the natural choice for finishing body work and paint was Gary Cunningham. Funny how some things are in life are constant. So here we are, back on the island, where we started out, reliving our youth, reveling in our children and grandchildren's successes, and generally enjoying life. While writing this, a couple of things have struck me. First, it is interesting to me how my life mirrors those of my two grandfathers. I spent most of my employment in the forest industry, as did Joe Taylor. I always had an interest in agriculture, and my, my desire to be a farmer was at least partially fulfilled, as was George Mathers. Second, when researching the ancestors who came to Canada and now are deceased, I have discovered that they are all at rest in the same place. They're just up the road in the Royal Oak Burial Park. Thank you. I 
I have a few pictures if you're interested later on to have a look at. Perhaps uh, some people have some questions, Jack. I see my friend Gary Cunningham is ready to roast me. Okay, Vicki, a quick question, Jack. Uh, the first one is uh, your mother's hair cutting skills. <laughs> yeah, sometime, sometime in her life she learned to be a hairdresser, my mother. She always looked after my hair. Anyway, my friends seem to find this out and she ended up cutting the neighborhood kids hair. So the Cunningham boys would troop down to our place and each take a turn sitting on a high stool in, the, in our kitchen and have their head trimmed. <laughs> oh, good old Butch. Yeah, I forgot about Butch. But busted after our dog. Is that <laughs> Actually, Butch was quite a Casanova. <laughs> he was... He, we got phone calls from various neighbors about Butch, who had female dogs, I guess, and he was outside their fence and would we kindly come and bring him home. Uh, he generally had the roam in the neighborhood, but from time to time had to be confined. You should tell him about the two grandfathers, Joe Taylor and your paternal grandfather. <laughs> in those days, the family all met, the families all had... Tell him about the two grandfathers. <laughs> Well, these guys had been friends in England, and they were friends in Moose Jaw, but they evidently had different political opinions. <laughs> we really didn't, I did, Fred paid closer attention to this than I did, but my, father, my grandfather Mather had a room in our house where he was pretty much confined because of his infirmity. So Joe Taylor would go and visit George in the bedroom. And then, after a time, the voices would be raised, and a little time further on, Joe Taylor would come storming out and say, come on, Fred, we're going home. <laughs> off they'd go. And I, I never knew what the, uh, what the subject was or why the upshot, but it happened regularly. It wasn't as if it only happened oh, once. They're, they're Sunday. <laughs> they're walking up the trail back home. I'm not going back there again. They're always going back there Sunday. <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah, we uh, actually, I, I didn't talk about it. We did, uh, uh, <clears throat> when I was about six or seven, right after the war, uh, my parents had been living in this rented house, and Mrs. Paula Blank was willing to sell. She had four acres right at the corner of Cordova Bay Road and the East Sandwich Road, which is now the Pat Bay Highway. And she was willing to sell two acres, so my father bought two acres for 900 bucks and uh, built a house in 1946, which is really where I grew up. And uh, I, uh, uh, Mrs. Paula Blank was always uh, kept all kinds of uh, menagerie of animals and ducks and so on and a cow. And uh, we spent lots of time over there. To, to How was your baby, Jack? Oh, yeah, that. And yeah, she was, she was also an entrepreneur. She uh, would sell bread at a roadside stand right at the corner of the East Saanich Road and Cordova Bay Road. And she, she had, her kitchen was quite an old-fashioned kitchen, and there was no counters in the kitchen. She had a huge big kitchen table, and everything was done on the kitchen table. Mrs. Paula Blank was a fairly robust woman. And you'd go in there when she was making bread, and she'd have a, she'd have a pile of bread the size of this table, and she'd be kneading it away. And she made, she made all this bread and filled up her roadside stand. And uh, I think she sold the little loaves for 15 cents and the big loaves for 20 cents, as I recall. But uh, it was all on the honor system, just like it is today. And people would come along, buy their bread, and put their 15 cents in the, in the little thing. So, yeah. It was, it was a good place to grow up. It was great. <laughs> well, yeah, Derek was, he was quite an intellectual guy, and he, and, uh, he actually wrote some, he's actually a published author, I should say. Pethick, his father, owned a mink farm for uh, uh, pelts uh, sold to the fur industry. Uh, uh, I actually, I was employed there for a while, feeding these mink, and the, the mink were fed with the entrails and the heads and so on, of fish that came from some fish processing plant. And he had a huge big grinder and he took all this stuff and grind it in and it stunk like hell. <laughs> and, and it was my job to go along and plop food in each of the mink's pens. But I was warned 
never stick your finger in there because they'll bite it off. <laughs> so I, anyway, I was successful at that. Uh, and the mink were contained in a great big compound all boarded in, so if they ever got out of the cage, they didn't get out into the, into the uh, surrounding territories. There was the odd escape because from time to time there were mink uh, living around Elk Lake, they'd escaped. And, and Derek was, a, as I say, a published author, bachelor, and uh, he's kind of an eccentric guy. Uh, but he used to, he used to, he used to have some money to invest. My father was a, an investment advisor, so he'd come along and he'd talk to my father about investments. But invariably, he would leave saying thank you very much and go across the street and deal with the investment house across the street. <laughs> so anyway, that that was my father's experience with Derek Peffick. <laughs> What about the collection? Yes. Well, well I, was, I wasn't always very good at collection, I, but the, the newspaper knew, sort of had, uh, had it figured out that kids sometimes weren't. So what they would do is send a bill for the papers that you'd had over the month. So the first collection had to go to them. They wanted their bill paid. <laughs> the rest of the ensuing month was up to me to make my living, so I would have to pedal down to the farthest reaches of the... Keating Valley to go and collect my money down there to, uh, I think I got about 20 bucks a month out of the whole thing. But anyway, that was, was all part of growing up at Elk Lake. Like I say, it was, was an enjoyable time. Uh, what I have here, I have a few pictures, in case you're interested, there's some old school pictures there, which Daryl says are not on the blog, and uh, some of my exploits in the, in the uh, quarter milers. I actually have my grand a copy of my gra of my great great grandfather's discharge papers in 1826 or whenever it is, uh, if if any of you are interested. Anyway, uh, and there are a few other uh, pictures. I I got pictures of my farm because that's one of the places that I was happy. These, these are a couple of pictures that were taken from an airplane. Just just before we left, actually, it was they've done it for years in farm country where uh, an airplane and a photographer go up and they take a picture of everybody's farm and then they come around knock on your door and sell you some pictures. Fortunately I wasn't home when these pictures came so Margaret bought them for me for Christmas so I got them totally uh, surprised at Christmas time which was very nice. It's interesting. Oh here's a here's <clears throat> here's part of our uh, farming venture here this was in the Armstrong Advertiser newspaper and it's a picture of me and my tractor we were putting, making silage bales. I'm sure you've seen them around the Sandwich Peninsula. They're, they're round bales wrapped in plastic. And it says here, it's unusual to put up hay in this area in the middle of October, but the warm fall weather produced a third crop of alfalfa in the, on this field at the Maggot Farm on Mountain View Road. The hay to wet the bale needed to be put up as silage and wrapped in plastic by Jack Mather. And uh, there I had my notoriety in Armstrong paper. Actually, the farm for 14 years was just a great portion of my life uh, after having done all the stuff that normal people do. Uh, it was uh, was a good time. Winning a car. The oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was in the quarter milers from 1958 to about 1960, I guess, and then we were living in Prince George. Anyway, in 1962, we came down to actually to attend a, a wedding. Margaret was to be a bride's a maid of honor. And during that time the Quarter Mile's car show was on. And I think it was Darrow decided that they would have a raffle of two cars. Actually the, the one was for one thing he decided that tickets would be ten cents a piece, reckoning that everybody would buy at least a dollar's worth. So there would be lots of tickets sold. <clears throat> he also or they also decided that if you came to the car show you could or if you bought a ticket you could win a car but if you also came to the car show you could win another car so there were two cars one was a 1949 Meteor one was a 1950 Ford and the 1950 Ford was actually fixed up fixed up quite nicely it wasn't all that good mechanically I found out but <laughs> but it was quite smart to look at and I had been to the show and bought my ticket, had my my ticket of admission, and 
on Saturday evening, I guess it was a Saturday, maybe a Sunday evening, no, Saturday evening it was, they drew the prize. I wasn't there when they drew the prize. The guy by the name of Rod Stevens drew the prize and he took the ticket out of the barrel and he said, and the winner is Jack Mather. <laughs> <laughs> and so sure enough, and, and our telephone didn't work. It was, it was your brother actually came, we were sleeping in, at my parents' place out at Elk Lake, came and knocked on the door and, and uh, we were still in bed. You won the car last night. So anyway, we did, and uh, I proceeded. Uh, well, I, I took the meteor, the 49 meteor. I took it up and left it at Lake Cowichan for future sale. And the Ford, which was, I thought looked pretty good, we started off for Prince George in that. Margaret was driving the family car. We had an old Chevy, and I was driving the Ford, and it looked really good. It had chrome wheels and red paint job and white upholstery and. So I thought, gee, the only, only set of chrome wheels in Prince George. This would be really something. Anyway, we got to about Hope, and things started to go wrong. <laughs> the, 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 the ignition started to act up, and the car would be going along fine, and all of a sudden, uh, and it uh, would buck and, and kick a little bit, and then it would go on. But as I drove through the big, long tunnel in the Fraser Canyon, I could hear the rear end starting to make an awful noise. <laughs> By the time we got to Cache Creek, the, I guess the pinion nut had come off the front of the, the uh, pinion shaft, and the pinion gear had fallen back into the crown gear, <laughs> and the whole thing piled up. So we were stuck in Cache Creek overnight. It was, we took a, whole <clears throat> a room in the hotel, and the hotel was full. And this was a B-grade hotel anyway. And outside our window, we, we did get a room, and the, the desk clerk said, well, I've rented the room out to another guy, but last I saw him, he was in the bar, and he was pretty drunk. I don't think he'll be coming tonight. <laughs> but just in case, you better make sure the door's locked. <laughs> so we spent a kind of a semi-sleepless night. We were right, the, the hotel had a big neon sign outside, said hotel, naturally enough, I suppose. But it was one of those ones that blinks on and off. So <laughs> through the window was this red light blinking on and off all night. And we had the door, the, the door propped shut with a, a chair. And Margaret, she was perfectly relaxed, of course. She didn't think anything was liable to happen. <laughs> we spent a fairly, a fairly uh, sleepless night. And then the next morning, we carried on to Prince George in the family car, leaving the Ford at a, at a service station in Cache Creek. Did you ever see the Ford again? Or not? Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I actually, I found a guy in, in Prince George who had a trailer. And he was to go down to Cache Creek and pick up the car. And he had a wrecking truck, too, which he pulled the trailer with. But just the day before he was to go get it, the finance company came and repossessed the trailer. But he needed cash, and I had agreed to pay him, I forget what it was, 100 bucks or whatever, to go down and get the car. So he just took the wrecking truck, went down, got the car, and he picked it up by the back end, because the back end wasn't functioning anymore, and left one of the side windows open, and pulled it back to Prince George. Well, they'd been paving between Cash Creek and Prince George, and there was loose gravel and tar on some of the roads. So when the car got back to Prince George, it was, the outside was covered in tar. And furthermore, the window being open, some of it had gotten in. It was all over the white upholstery, too. So we spent, Margaret and I, we, uh, <clears throat> we spent, I don't know how many evenings with uh, uh, road tar and, and mosquitoes bug remover or whatever, and cheesecloth. The woman in the, in the fabric store couldn't figure out what in the hell I was doing with all this cheesecloth. She finally asked me, what are you doing with it? And I said, well, I'm trying to clean up my car and I don't want to scratch the paint. So anyway, that was good enough for her. We finally got the thing back clean enough. And then I, oh, I went to a wrecker in Prince George, found another rear end for the thing, and I was a volunteer fireman at that time. And uh, so I took it down to the, we lived in an apartment, so I took it down to the fire hall and uh, jacked it up in the back of the fire hall, and yanked the ankles out, put the new rear and center section in it, and uh, that's, <clears throat> then it carried on. And actually, there was a, a young woman in working in a different bank from me who wanted to buy my car. She used to send me notes, and those times we used to exchange the checks between banks. So every morning in the, in the, in the, what we call the clearing, the checks from the Bank of Nova Scotia coming into the Bank of Toronto, 
There was a little note in there saying, please, Mr. Mather, don't sell your car to anybody else but me. So anyway, when we were ready to leave Prince George, I sold it. I sold that car to her. And, and actually, it became fairly well known around Prince George. I, I corresponded with some guys in old-time hot rodders in Prince George, and they remember the car well, long after I was rid of it. Ah, <laughs> Cunningham's, I used to have lunch at Cunningham's from time to time. They never had soup, they had stew. It was, it was tomato soup, but they put so many crackers in it, it became stew. <laughs> and I used, to, I used to take a couple crackers, put it in, and eat my soup. His dad used to say to me, Jack, he says, put some crackers in the soup. <laughs> he thought that I, uh, I should get my nourishment that way, I guess, I don't know. This, this is our grade one class of Miss Old Haber uh, and uh, some of the, uh, the local kids. Uh, <clears throat> and this is our grade 12 class, the 24 that graduated. And there are some commonality here. For one thing, Grant Sheldrake, who is, uh, comes here often, is in, in this picture. I think this is the third grade. And there he is in our graduating class. Uh, and. Uh, Oh, the Pearson girls, the Pearson girls that were at my second birthday party, they're both here. My cousin John and uh, others that you would know. Uh, we were about halfway between Armstrong and Enderby at, on what's called Back Enderby Road. No, it, was a, it was a great time, but I, I, both of us came from the island and uh, we discussed the option of staying in Armstrong Town, you know, after farming and uh, decided I, did, I didn't want to stay in the farm. I didn't want to sort of uh, watch. As, if I was getting out of farming, I didn't want to watch someone else farm my land. And the, the town, we just thought, no, we really want to go back to Vancouver. We have a daughter here. And uh, so uh, we, we decided this is where we wanted to retire. So anyway, uh, if you're done, I'm done. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. The quarter milers. This is this was some of our good deeds uh, during the quarter milers days. Can you see that? Okay. This is us doing a in a hot rod, doing a toy run where we delivered toys prior to the motorcycle guys doing it. I guess 1958. It's dated anyway, and this is the colonist newspaper. It says a super deluxe service is in high gear today, doing a voluntary delivery job throughout Greater Victoria of toys from the Christmas Bureau going to 400 needy families. Zooming around delivery routes are members of the Quarter Miners Club, youths who build their own cars. Jerry Smith behind the wheel of his old powered roadster is almost swamped as helpers load up. Left to right, Ray Cody, Bob Clark, and Jack Mather. Toys include large items like bikes and doll carriages. Oh, here's another one. This is us, this is us doing, can you see that? Yeah. This is us doing a uh, club car inspection. This is Bob Clark's car, actually, but that's me that's underneath, evidently, uh, trying to find things to inspect. And, and here's, uh, the quarter milers also have a, not a blog, I guess, it's a website. But this is a picture of uh, my first hot rod. Uh, this is 1960 at Elk Lake, and this is today. Uh, same make and model car. Uh, this one I bought for $125. Uh, <clears throat> it's a family secret what this one cost. <laughs> the first car you should tell them was called Little Brown Jug, and it was quite famous around here for a large number of years. The, the car was. It was. Uh, uh, it was in 1959 I finally got it painted 
and it was the 1960 Oldsmobile color. They'd just come out of, with this new color, and it was called Cordovan Brown Metallic, and it was, I thought, pretty smart. So uh, anyway, I had the car painted that color, and at that time it was fashionable to put a name on the side of your car, and, and I had all kinds of suggestions as to what I might call it. Uh, anyway, we decided there was, a, there was a good whiskey in those days that came in a jug like that. It was called Little Brown Jug. So we decided that that was appropriate. And a guy by the name of Dave Winter, who was a pretty uh, well-known uh, car striper artist, uh, put, the, put the name on the side for me. So, and it was around here for quite a while, too. Just, uh, just thinking of the 53 or 52 Ford, that was kind of, what did my dad say about the had a decorative thing on the trumpet. Oh yeah, he had, that was a, there was, was a scallop paint job, but I couldn't afford a lot. So Dave Winter put a couple of little scallops on it, but he put a little thing on the back and uh, it was, was shaped like an inverted T, an inverted letter T, except it was quite rounded. Chuck Cunningham looked at that and he says, Jack, it looks like you got a tack up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the farm for 14 years was just a great portion of my life uh, after having done all the stuff that normal people do. Uh, it was, uh, was a good time. <laughs>